Thank you for joining us here. I think it's good to be back in the Beltway. I'm not, mm, it's been a while. But when I was last here, 20 years ago, it was the dawn of the 21st century. And the United States was a respected and admired world leader. We were, in the words of a European prime minister, handing a lasting peace to our children. And as peace and prosperity go hand in hand, our government for the first time in decades had surpluses. Now through a never ending series of poor decisions by Republicans and Democrats, we have a trillion dollar deficit for this year and counterproductive and senseless wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan. It's hard to believe that the chaos and heartbreak that has spread through the Syrian and Iraqi region all started with a lie from our government that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Only 23 of us, as Christopher said, senators recognized this lie and voted no. I was the only Republican to vote no. It is because of these lies and the subsequent loss of trust in our government that America has lost its way. At this moment, when we face the prospect of another endless war, now more than ever, we must stand up for the truth. I have here in my hand, and it's available on the table outside, the authorization for the use of military force that allowed the United States to commence the war in Afghanistan. You'll see at the top, draft, 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 you'll see one word's crossed out. With this sloppy paper, I walked into the Senate chambers two days after September 11, 2001, to vote on how to respond to the events of that fateful day. All these years later, this paper is the legal justification for the mayhem we sow around the world. This sloppy piece of paper. And then a year later came all the lies from, listen to this lineup, President Bush, Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary Powell, Director Condoleezza Rice, Director George Tennant, and others about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. This is an ancient history. We are living daily with the consequences. Real veterans issues, refugee displacement, the loss of trust in our government, and now a crisis with Iran. The invasion of Iraq was the worst strategic plunder in American history, without a doubt. The truth is that now, after over 4,000 American lives, $6 trillion, and a generation, I came through the Vietnam era, I know about veterans coming home, a generation of scarred veterans, the truth is that Iraq is now starting to side with Iran against us. And the truth is also that under both Republican and Democratic administrations, under the guise of increased security, our government tortured prisoners, engaged in extraordinary rendition, which is nothing short of kidnapping, killed Americans by drone strikes without due process, and expanded illegal surveillance by the National Security Agency. The truth is that largely because of these long wars, our fiscal policy is unsustainable. Listen to this. In November alone, the government spent $434 $430 billion and took in only $225 billion. Our deficit for this year is a trillion dollars. The total is $22.6 trillion. And the interest on the debt is $400 billion a year. Would you run your business or household this way? Reckless deficit spending is the fault of both Republicans and Democrats. It wouldn't happen without both of them. And the truth is there, are not, there is another war that needs to end, the failed war on drugs. Internationally, our policies of eradication, substitution, and interdiction are an abject failure and have caused vastly more harm than good. And at home, our prisons are full of nonviolent drug offenders. What we need 
is an active, open-minded discussion in this country that results in real criminal justice reform, and that includes decriminalization. The truth is also that our country is gripped by division and gridlock. Many Americans have lost their trust in our government. It was with times like these that the framers of our Constitution wrote our Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, and yes, the Second Amendment. All were written for the possibility of a government that could not be trusted. The issues of our time are clear. We must stop the escalation of endless war, rein in our skyrocketing deficits, and protect our personal liberties in the face of government encroachment. The challenges we face are formidable, but they can be overcome through hard work and commitment to the truth. We need to declare void the authorization for the use of military force. Let Congress have a robust debate about our long-term global interests as the Constitution mandates. We need to ratchet down the tension across the world, not only in the Middle East, but also in North Africa, Ukraine, Venezuela, and North Korea, through strong American diplomacy, not belligerence. I'd like to tell a quick story about voting for the AUMF two days after September 11th. Republicans and Democrats met in separate rooms. Uh, Republican senators from Mansfield and Democrats from the LBJ room. We were handed this piece of paper. Our leaders gave a pep talk about voting for it, and uh, we filed in. And they said the two leaders would make comments, and then we'd have two votes, one for the authorization, the other to give New York City after September 11, $20 billion in, in aid. So as we filed in, I can remember looking at it and seeing the draft, 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 and the crossed off word. And the crossed off word, if you haven't seen the paper, is whereas on September 11th, acts of despicable violence, the, the, the original text said, acts of treacherous violence were committed against the United States and its citizens. They crossed off treacherous, rightfully so, because treachery comes from within, and put despicable above it, handwritten in. As I file in, I'm, I remember Gordon Smith, Senator Smith from Oregon was next to me. I'm going, I don't like this. Uh, they can't even give us a clean copy. We're going to war. I know the, the smoke's still coming out of the Pentagon and everything, but, and he said, Link, the train's left the station. So the roll starts, and they call the roll, Link and Schaefer from Rhode Island. And I say, no. And a senator next to me, I forget who it was, says, Link, you just voted against the money for New York City. I don't want to do that. No, this is the AUMF vote. No, it's the money for New York City. And the senators around me are arguing. So I said, I'll, I'll go down and ask the parliamentarian. I walked down to the well of the Senate. What are we voting on? One of them said the money for New York City. The other one said the authorization for the use of military force. They started arguing among themselves. This is a true story. And this is, this, this is ongoing here in 2020, that kind of chaos that occurred then. And I'm a C early in the alphabet, and my staff saw me on the monitor voting no, and with the smoke still coming out of the Pentagon and the uh, uh, Pennsylvania and New York City, they set a 100-yard dash record to get over and grab me by the lapels and say, you cannot vote no. You've got to give the president authorization to respond. And since I'm a C and I was able to change my vote before they finished the vote. I'll say one more thing about this also is that they have the whereas is whereas is and then the therefore. And in the therefore, it says the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he, de he, he determined, planned, authorized, committed. It was. It wasn't designed for 2020. It was designed for back then. Who knows what it would be a woman president? Lastly, I'll just ask a question. Does anyone know there was uh, 535 members of Congress, 435 House members, 100 senators, one person voted against this? Anybody know who? He wins from Oakland, California, and she's still in office. And I almost did, but uh, my staff uh, convinced me. And uh, 
after she got death threats and was hanged in effigy and had to have security, I was thinking maybe I made the right vote at that time. Well, back to uh, where we are today. What we need to do is protect our constitutional rights. And I'm proposing that the abuses of the National Security Agency have become egregious to the point that this agency should be phased out of existence. And Edward Snowden told the truth, and he should be allowed to come home. We need to end our failed war on drugs and have a real conversation about personal freedom and responsibility. We need to work towards a lasting peace for our children, one that results in a safer world and a balanced budget, because after all, peace and prosperity do go hand in hand. And we also must restore American credibility around the world. And that begins at the top. I have always led with the truth, and I will always do so. As many of you know, I've served in public office at the local, state, and federal levels. As mayor, I kept taxes down and provided such quality services that in my last term, I won a majority in every ward and every district in the city, despite being from a party that was the wrong party in my city. I hadn't been a Republican in 32 years before I got there. As an independent governor, I came in at the depths of the recession and led our state to the second biggest drop in the unemployment rate of any state in the country. And knowing the true power of love, I championed the successful fight for marriage equality, despite the opposition of our state Senate leadership and powerful lobbies. As a senator, I was known for bucking my party to cast what were sometimes lonely votes. When I voted against the Iraq war and to protect our civil liberties, I stood up for truth, not partisan interests. In 2008, Americans voted overwhelmingly for change. But at the end of eight years, the wars continued and our civil liberties remained in peril. Again in 2016, the American people voted for change. And yet the deficit has soared and we find ourselves at the precipice of another needless conflict. I'm happy to report that there is another way. When I recently moved from Rhode Island to Wyoming, I considered the Libertarian Party. I looked them up, found their statement of principles and the platform that allow, outlines the Libertarian positions on the issues. Anti-war, anti-cronyism, anti-debt, anti-torture, anti-death penalty, anti-war on drugs, anti-spying, pro-personal freedom, pro-truth. On these and other issues, I saw a party I could proudly embrace. So I registered as a libertarian with no other plans beyond that. But then word got out and I started finding myself welcomed by so many friendly libertarians who reached out. At first it was just curiosity, but as we got to know each other, I realized I wanted to do more than just register to vote. I wanted to help the libertarian party in any way that I could. I started attending events and meeting with candidates. And the more that I learned from them, the more that I realized I'd found my political home. I also started getting requests to take it to the next stop, next step, to consider running for president as someone who has won elective office outside the two-party system. And so I began to give it serious consideration, particularly as the news got out about the Middle East and it got more and more alarming. This is an issue I really care about. As we've gone to the brink of war with Iran, I have made up my mind. So that's why I'm here today to say my name is Lincoln Chafee. I'm running for president as a libertarian. I look forward to joining the other candidates, seeking our party's nomination in a constructive dialogue, attending state conventions and other events, and working to earn the support of delegates to the Libertarian National Convention to be held at the end of May in Austin, Texas. The truth is, Democrats and Republicans cannot be trusted to fulfill their campaign promises. Yes, we're going to end the war. Yes, we're going to end the war. They go on and on. 
The Libertarian Party is the party of real change and that will bring forth a more peaceful world, a balanced federal budget, and fervent protection of our civil liberties. We must right the wrongs that the lies of the past have created in order to build a future of peace and prosperity. And it all starts by telling the truth. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Any questions? Yeah, Justin, uh, on behalf of the Wire Service Marijuana Moment, you mentioned drug decriminalization. Do you apply that to all substances, or are you referring to only a select few? It starts with a, a, a broad conversation and uh, getting everybody involved, law enforcement, health officials, and, uh, and that's the process. And there are other models around the world, whether it's Portugal or, or Uruguay or uh, Holland, and we can learn from them. Hello, Aaron from CBS. When you look at the current slate of candidates, uh, both on the Republican and Democrat side, what do you think is missing that you can bring to the table? Well, foreign affairs, the, the uh, discourse on foreign affairs and what's happening uh, around the world. And uh, as I said, the belligerence instead of diplomacy. Uh, I'd like to hear more of that dialogue going on uh, as the campaign unfolds here in 2020. And I, I don't hear much about foreign affairs and, and different points of view. Thank you, Governor. Um, well, it's, it's taboo to talk about. Yes. Ford Fisher from News to Share. Uh, so you've talked a lot about sort of the foreign policy failures of the last couple of decades. Um, if you became president, you'd be inheriting uh, quite a situation, it seems, with Iran. So given uh, where the Bush, Obama, Trump kind of legacy has left us, uh, how would you kind of inherit that? And, and what would you do about uh, the Middle East kind of going forward? As I said in the remarks, uh, formidable, uh, formidable challenges ahead. Uh, not naive about that. But don't forget, as far as Iran goes, that it was only a few years ago, only a few years ago, that uh, we crafted the Iran nuclear deal with the help of the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Russia, China, obviously Iran and the United States there at the table. We're there at the table, we're talking, we're making some kind of progress. We're not vilifying each other and escalating threats in this age of nuclear weapons that we live in. And don't forget, Pakistan, an Islamic country, has nuclear weapons. This is serious business. Governor Morgan Wright with Nexstar Media Group. Just wondering if you could take us through the timing of this announcement. Um, you know, you mentioned Iran, but what else is fueling this? Obviously, the, the war on drugs you mentioned, there's you highlighted a figurative and a literal war that we may be getting involved with, but can you take us through some of the other inspiration for uh, you know, driving this announcement? Yeah, going back to the uh, worst strategic blunder in American history, getting invading Iraq, and I, I read that list, President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, CIA Director, National Security Advisor, uh, on and on it went, on and on it went. That, said Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction when he barely even had a tank or an airplane. Uh, and th those kind of lies just alarm me that how could they happen in our country? And they continue. They just keep continuing. We're still in Iraq, we're still in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan papers have said there's no end in sight. There's no victory possible. And they know it. And we're still sending our soldiers there. So that's the motivator. And it's been a process of just watching this the elections uh, in 08, change in 16. Let's see what happens. Is anybody going to make a change? And it doesn't happen. And it has ramifications to our budget. I have children. It, it, this is unsustainable, this kind of spending. And a lot of it's related to these wars and the compromising of our personal liberties. Oh, it's okay to tap our phones. No, it's not. The Fourth Amendment is clear. Get a warrant. Governor? Uh, Eric Altieri with Normal News. 
Uh, when you ran uh, previously in the Democratic primary, uh, one of your key issues was moving America towards the metric system. Uh, was that, will that still be a plank in your current platform? Uh, that's a, another lie. <laughs> I barely mentioned metric. At the end of talking about banning capital punishment, these are what I was going to do to, back, to get our credibility back and better mash the United States back into international affairs. And I said, let's ban torture, let's ban drone strikes, let's ban capital punishment, let's have rapprochement with the Soviet Union, with Russia and Venezuela and uh, North Korea. And then I said, by the way, a good way to get back with the world would do the same kind of measurements they do. It was a minor, almost throwaway line. And nobody asked me about drone strikes. Nobody asked me about torture, banning torture. Nobody asked me about banning capital punishment. That's what's wrong. That's what's wrong. Off into some shallow, trivial laugh line. That's why we are where we are. That's why we have a $22 trillion deficit. That's why we have endless wars overseas, because we don't want to talk about the serious issues. Let's get a laugh out of it. Governor, to that same end, uh, the lack of inclusion of the libertarian candidate in the presidential debates, as well as just generally the media's uh, tendency to uh, not report on third-party candidates has been sort of alarming. What would you do to sort of break through that and make uh, voters aware that you're actually out there and running as a third option? Well, uh, the people, I trust the people, the American people, and different phenomenons take place. Uh, John Dean uh, all of a sudden came of obscure governor of Vermont, all of a sudden got traction, his message was anti-war. Uh, Senator Sanders, another rather obscure senator from Vermont, got traction talking about income inequality. That, uh, President Trump, whoever thought uh, he caught on with the Republican base, uh, no one ever thought that would happen. So you, I trust the American people and the message has to resonate and timing has to be right and anything can happen. Thanks, Governor. Richard Jordan, Senior International Correspondent for Ask Congress TV. What would you say to the young people who are outside on Friday mornings outside the United Nations in New York uh, talking about and, and yelling and screaming about the climate crisis? And follow-up question, would you rejoin the Paris Accord if, when you are elected president? Yes, I, I believe that the, of course I'd rejoin any international agreement that's in our children's best interest. And uh, that, that's a big part of my platform, is working with our friends and neighbors, uh, making more friends and uh, allies rather than more adversaries. Uh, as the line goes, jaw, jaw, jaw is better than war, war, war. And uh, I, I would talk to anybody and, and work with any, all countries to address our uh, communal challenges which are many, whether it's the war on drugs, working with the Portuguese, the Uruguayans that have some experience with what they've done with decriminalization, uh, Dutch on these issues, on climate change, uh, the big coal, uh, CO2 producing countries, get at the table. Now, I know you have to provide electricity for your people. Uh, how can we do this without ruining our planet? Uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, from what Democrats so far are saying about the situation in Iran, what is your biggest issue with what you're hearing from them? Uh, they're not strong enough. They're, uh, they're saying of oh, Soleimani was a, a evil man, and it, it's uh, they're they're not going back to the root cause, the invasion of Iraq, uh, and the bad mistakes that we made, and. Uh, Rather, what, we, what got us to the peace and prosperity that I talked about at the dawn of this century, where we had surpluses in a peaceful world, the uh, Prime Minister said, handing a peaceful world to our children. That, he saw years of, of peace. At that time, he did. And, and it all fell apart after September 11th. But that was, occurred because of words such as perestroika, glasnost, uh, detente. These things work. The Arabs have a word for it, hudna, it's a cooling down, a cooling down. And I, I don't see enough of that from many of the candidates. They're playing into the, the anger and the fear, as what happened after September 11th, 
And we are angry when some uh, contractor gets killed in Iraq, but it's better to have a cooling down than a heating up. In this age of nuclear weapons, and Pakistan has nuclear weapons, this isn't an obscure threat to our children's future. Thanks for coming again. Our planet's special and our country's special, and this is a democratic process, and let's go out there and have some fun. Yeah, one more. Of course. Hi, uh, Hala Nicholas, public school teacher and libertarian. Do you have any plans for like education, what to do to implement a better system for our country? Yes, I served at the local level, which is uh, provides the education, the public education system, uh, K through 12. Uh, what town are you in? Uh, Fairfax County. Fairfax County. So it's a county system. Where I, uh, in Rhode Island, it was uh, a city system. The property taxes paid for all our schools. Uh, and yes, there was a school committee, but working with them, uh, intimately involved in the most important issue, in I believe, is providing good schools. You're going to prosper as a community if you have good schools. I believe that. And then as a governor, it's our job to provide the resources to the state college. In Rhode Island, we had three state colleges, University of Rhode Island, Rhode Island College, and Community College of Rhode Island. Providing the state money, and it's always hard in a budget, coming up with that money to keep tuitions down. That's what made America great. Low tuitions to go to University of uh, Montana or, or all these state colleges across the country, uh, Missouri State or whatever it might be. All, they're low tuitions, you can go get a good education. Uh, but in the federal level, it's really not a federal issue. And I talk about the, um, the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment said what's not specifically said in the Constitution is reserved for the states. And I think the federal government's just gotten its fingers into too many pies. Let the states, let the cities, the, the, let the counties, in your case, uh, deal with this issue. I care about it, but, and I've done it, but I don't think it's a federal issue. And I'm gonna be, if I were ever fortunate enough to get elected, the Tenth Amendment's gonna be a big part of how we drive down this deficit. Thanks again. Thank you.